Um, so I'm Miguel. I ha have here with me uh, Jean Natkarni, and um, we both went to a conference last week that was dedicated to uh, the application of machine learning and artificial intelligence, specifically to programming. So it was not like one of those AI conferences where you're talking about uh, chatbots and all the hyped stuff. It was specifically about how do we apply these techniques to help us with code, with uh, in code interpretation, with uh, finding bugs, with uh, augmenting productivity. So this was very close to our heart. And we took uh, a lot of information from there. And uh, we want to share it with you today because that's actually what's the, the state of the art of, uh, of these techniques uh, in, in the domain of uh, programming. So um, to get started, and because a lot of people on our audience are not uh, very familiar with uh, machine learning um, topics, uh, we'll just introduce some things very uh, briefly in a very light uh, manner. So um, the, the first thing that uh, we'll introduce is uh, neural networks uh, very briefly. So we can think of them just as a, having a, a black box. In this case, it's, a, it's blue, but it's OK. Um, where uh, something gets in and something else will get out. And we uh, have some structure inside this uh, black box. We won't think too much about it. Uh, but one key aspect is that there will be a lot of numbers, probably in some in some matrices uh, with with a bunch of numbers. Like here's a five, and here's a three, and something like this. And these numbers will affect how this x will turn into the the y. And so the the process of training a neural network is actually figuring out uh, these numbers. Okay, so this is very lightweight. This X can be an image, text, anything. Uh, it will be converted to numbers when it gets in, and it can be converted to back to an image or text or whatever when, when it gets out. So that, that's the, the, the basic uh, neural network. And then uh, throughout this talk, we might talk also about some other stuff like uh, recurrent neural networks and convolution neural networks. These are some some specific kinds uh, of neural networks. So, uh, if if we think of uh, a network that will uh, process a, a sequence of inputs, so I have this thing, I have like a previous state, I have a new input coming, and I have an output. So this is my x, this is my my y, and I have some state and when the next element comes in so when the the now it won't be x1 it will be x2 i'll use the previous state back here and so this is like a recurrent unit that's good for processing sequences using the the same unit so it's not a anything very very difficult and um, convolution uh, networks are something that when i have like a big input I have this network, and this will look at one piece of the inputs at the time, and it will combine them and project them into something, again, a little bit bigger. So this is good for looking at images where uh, I want to see if there's a, a dog in the image or something, and the dog might be anywhere in the image. And so you can see how this could help identifying a dog regardless of, of the position, because it will kind of look everywhere. Um, yeah, so um, that's essentially this. Uh, they have these uh, acronyms, and it, it's not very relevant to think deeply about these for now. Uh, it's just so that you have the, the gist. And um, OK, another concept that's going to be uh, um, recurrent uh, throughout this talk is the, the concept of embeddings. And so um, embeddings um, are um, work like this. Uh, I have a concept, let's say a person. I have uh, uh, John here. And uh, John is a person that has a lot of characteristics, 
but I'm going to, to think about only some of them and I'm going to score their, them with numbers. So I'll have here a vector of numbers, uh, many numbers that define John. And I don't even know what these numbers are. And now let's think about, I, I have a city like Lisbon or something, and I'm going to say that this city is also defined by a bunch of numbers. And now John says, hey, I like Lisbon. I'm going to score it with uh, score five. And there's some other guy here that's Matt. He doesn't like Lisbon. He also has a lot of numbers to define him, but he doesn't like Lisbon. He likes uh, Madrid a little better. Madrid is also defined by a lot of numbers. And so without uh, thinking too much about what each of these numbers mean, uh, the idea here is that if I have uh, enough of these people, enough cities, and enough scores, I could like try to guess what numbers I could have here so that uh, people times city uh, would give me this score. And the, the thing that would happen here is that let's say that weather is a relevant characteristic for uh, someone to like a city. So this guy, uh, John, likes when uh, it's sunny weather. And so probably the model uh, that trains this will, will learn that there should be a number here that will kind of relate to weather that's going to be like really high. And uh, this will probably be really high in Lisbon too, but in some Nordic uh, city, this will be scored really low so that the score here uh, will get down for John and this city. And so what's happening here is that we're encoding information uh, about things into numbers that kind of have some semantic meaning. We don't really know what that meaning will be. The model that we train will figure that out. Um, perhaps if we then sort the, the cities by, by these numbers, we can look at the, the ranking and understand, oh, the, the ones that have this high number all have uh, high criminality. So this might be what the, the model le learned about these cities. But it's not as much important uh, uh, to, to understand what each number means individually. What's important is that now we have this thing, we call it an, an embedding, which is a representation of the, the concept as a bunch of numbers. And so the, the concept can now be thought of as a point in a multi-dimensional vector space, as many dimensions as the numbers that, that we have here. And so uh, this uh, allows us to do some calculations over these semantics. And uh, an example is uh, some guys at Google did something called word to vec uh, which was they picked up lots of words, tried to convert them into these vectors of numbers. They got like uh, 200 dimensions um, for, for each one. And um, so they, they got these interesting results where um, you can see like, the, the point that that's, uh, represents king and the, the vector that takes it to the point that represents queen is the same that takes uh, the point for man into the point for woman. So this semantic relation can be uh, understood by adding and subtracting uh, vectors. And this is really interesting because it shows that the, the model can some, somehow capture a lot of knowledge, even if we don't know exactly what it is, and it can capture a lot of the relations between that logic. And that's very important for reasoning about, about uh, a lot of uh, this, this information. Okay, next concept. Uh, I hope you're paying attention. Uh, I, I know that you just had lunch and so, uh, um, but um, the, what I want to talk about here is not attention, but it's more like focused attention. So you, you can um, easily think that for a lot of tasks, not all inputs are born the same. So if I'm translating a sentence, each word uh, should um, pay more or less attention to some other words depending on some context, right? So. Uh, this this uh, example of a translation uh, 
we can see that there are like the European economic area. It, it, it doesn't follow exactly the words that are on that position. It has to some, somehow look at different positions to, to understand how, how this thing gets uh, translated. So this concept of attention essentially is uh, we're going to have uh, a, a lot of weights that will tell us where should we look at. And uh, why is this um, a, a thing? Is just, whoops, not what I wanted. Um, how will we get to these weights of what to look at? That's easy. We use a neural network for that. So we have this thing that's going to be called uh, an attention network uh, that's going to tell us uh, where should we look at, and we, it will get the, the inputs. And this network will belong to a bigger model that uh, will do something with, uh, with this. Um, and this attention network is uh, trained as the whole model is trained because it's the combination of both that, that will try to, to make it so that this Y gives us the, the thing that, that we want. So this is not a, uh, a concept that's difficult to understand, but it, it makes a lot of difference because uh, when you're not treating everything the same, you're giving more importance to the most important things, your model will be able to produce uh, better results. And so, uh, Given this uh, introduction of concepts, um, I'm going just to talk about the, the most uh, pursued topics that we've seen in the talks that, that were uh, in, in this conference. Uh, so what most people tried to do uh, was uh, finding types of things in the code. Uh, and it's mostly because um, JavaScript, lots of people use JavaScript. JavaScript doesn't have uh, good support for uh, understanding types beforehand, it leads to a lot of bugs. So there's a lot of people investing uh, in this, but JavaScript, but also Python and other dynamic languages. Um, finding bugs, that's an obvious one. And uh, code synthesis, which means uh, writing code based on something, some specifications, some ideas, some kind of autocomplete. Um, and uh, there, there's, there has been a lot of developments in natural language processing. Uh, some of them can be used for, for code, but uh, code is harder generally. Um, because in, in natural language, for instance, when you're translating a sentence, you can usually just look into that sentence. In code, when you're translating code, you have like references that can be in different files or in the same file, but a really big file and the constant in def is defined uh, in line one and you're using key in line uh, 2000. So there's a big sparsity. So it makes the, the problem a lot harder. Um, there's a lot of uh, new words. So programmers create new words to, 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 to name variables. So I named the, the variable name of the dog, right? Not just name dog and so because I have these words that are combinations and name of the dog two or first name five um, it, it uh, becomes difficult to have a, a vocabulary of meanings for for these things um, then we have specification issues so let, let's try to do code synthesis uh, where's the spec of my program usually we don't have a, a really formal spec Perhaps some guys doing some work at NASA for an embedded system. They have a formal spec of the system, but usually we don't have that. We don't even have an informal spec. It's like, uh, this should do something like this, and we, we go and, and make it, and we have to figure it all out by ourselves. And finally, uh, there's zero tolerance for errors. So when you're um, in, uh, in uh, speech and natural language, uh, if you try to speak the truth, um, people will understand what you're, uh, tell, what you're saying. But if you're using code and you try to speak the truth, uh, it will not work. Uh, and that's uh, very annoying. So, um, 
Okay, um, but before we get into AI, we already have some stuff that tries to tackle these kind of problems. So finding types, we have stuff like uh, flow, TypeScript, compilers, uh, finding bugs, we also have some static analysis tools. And for code synthesis, we have uh, a lot of uh, things that we can also use, like some forms of autocomplete and templates, code snippets. These all, we already have this. But we all know that all these have limitations. So when these tools for finding types and static analysis, they can only go so far. Uh, they, there's a lot that they don't understand about our context. We all know that they are not uh, perfect. And um, regarding autocomplete based on, on templates and code snippets, we all know that we have the template, but then we have to uh, change a lot of it. So we want to lower that, that barrier. Uh, so all these can be improved by, by using some sort of machine learning techniques. Okay, and um, we actually had a talk on, on the conference about some, some, some guy at, at Facebook that uh, talked about a tool that they have that does static uh, analysis. So they say, yeah, we use ML, but uh, not machine learning. It's more like OCaml. It's a programming language. Um, and uh, the, the, he, he had these great insights that are also useful to us, which is, Developers don't really care about warnings and bug reports. So this infer is a tool that tries to analyze code and tells you a lot of warnings and where you might have uh, bugs. And the developers are usually like, hey, that code is like four years old. Nobody complains. I'm not going to you know, change that because it ain't, apparently it ain't broken. So I, I, I'm not going to care about these warnings. Um, and so what they did was they changed their tools so that the warnings would be given only for new code or code that was just changed. And so the tool was not plugged into the IDE or whatever. It's plugged into the code review process. It goes there and it looks at the specific changes that were made and uh, only comments on those. Of course, this, this has a lot of problems like uh, what if I change uh, only this code, but it's going to be to have impact all over the place? Well, this tool will not look at it because it's only looking at the, the specific scope of changes, but that's the, the way they, they, they figured out so they could solve this. And so um, we're finally getting into ML and um, to get here, we, I'm just going to, to talk about an idea. This was actually introduced in the first talk of the, the, converse, the, the, the conference. So it was really cool because it's then used uh, all over the place, which is uh, bimodal software. And people that were in this company like three years ago will probably think, I heard this bimodal thing uh, somewhere. Um, well. It's not um, the same meaning. So this was the bimodal IT. And here we're talking about bimodal uh, software interpretation. And so uh, I can explain this better with, with an example. Um, if you look at this function, you see a function that adds to numbers and everything seems all right. And if you look at this function, it's the same function. It also adds to numbers and it, there's also no problem. Uh, if you look at this function, it's also the same function. But now there's something weird. I mean, I add width and height and, and get the area. No, I should be multiplying it, right? So um, the, the idea here is that syntax alone doesn't tell us, uh, only tells us so much about the program. There's a lot of information that's uh, hidden in variable names and method names that's uh, encoded in natural language. And that allows us to reason a little bit better ab about the program. Um, so we could fix fix this function if it was uh, buggy and, and have it like this. Uh, so now it seems correct, unless I put something that's not even code, it's a comment. And now uh, something's weird again. Uh, unless this is a very big triangle, um, the, the function that doesn't seem to, to do what it was supposed to. And so the, the general idea here is that we, we can think of code as having two channels of information. 
Uh, one, that's the syntax and the AST and all, all that thing that we're used to. And the other, that's the natural language encoded information that we can also use as a signal to have a deeper understanding about the code and about the intention of the, the code. And so having introduced all this, uh, I'm going to uh, lend the stage to João. Thank you. <laughs> so I'm going to present now a big topic area of this conference that was about sequences that are treated with the recurrent neural networks that Ventura already mentioned and embeddings. Basically, I'm going to do just a simple comparison in the word to vec approach that Ventura mentioned. It's a natural language approach, uh, but the uh, similar problem in program, programming language, basically the sentence are the program and the words of the sentences are translated to tokens in terms of program. So I'm going to present here a approach that basically what it does is to translate a snippet of code just to a vector representation. This is basically a similar approach than word to vec but using the structure of, of the programming code. Basically, this approach uh, treats a program not like text. Uh, text is just a, a sequence of words, but it treats a program with its, with its uh, abstract syntax tree to capture all the semantic and structural relationship between the tokens. Basically, what it does is it captures all the synthetic paths between leaves of the AST and feeds that to a to an attention mechanism that weights those pets and combines all the, those pets into a single uh, vector that represents all the code. Basically, um, you can use then this representation of code for different tasks like uh, code search, uh, refactoring suggestions, but in this publication, the uh, it was used for naming the code snippet. It was basically... Demo. <laughs> yes, demo will, will come. Uh, it was basically uh, an, a, a function. It was used to name a, a function, basically. You will see it, basically. You have this, this function here, for example. Uh, it's a pretty uh, well-known function. I guess you, you would be uh, able to name it. It's a factorial function. It has an F where the function name is, and uh, the program will be able to give the function name. It's guessed right with a 47% chance that is factorial. You can see here also the AST of the program. It highlights with uh, a stronger, a bolder uh, line the, the paths that are more important to, to make this prediction. Basically, here you can actually see what are the paths that are more important to see this, uh, this uh, prediction. It, it's really cool that. Uh, attention mechanism is visible here, basically. You can also see another program that uh, it's a well-known program also, it contains basically, and it will, it will give very accurate, very accurately that name. And actually the second one was also cool, that matches. But actually this, uh, this approach not only gives uh, a really good summarization of the code in the vector form, but it also is able to capture really rich embeddings be, uh, between the, yeah, sure. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. How, how is it seen as a no, no, the tree, the tree is not, uh, basically each pet of the tree, uh, it, it captures each pet of the tree and puts it in one vector along with the nodes, the embeddings basically, it, it makes the embeddings of the pets and the embeddings of the leaves that the pet connects. He has all those embeddings. He passes it to an attention mechanism and uh, the attention mechanism gives weight to the pets. And uh, then those pets are summed up given the, according to those weights uh, and it outputs a vector basically. That tree is the input. Yeah, that tree is the input of the program. Exactly. And it maps the program to a yeah. vector representation. Yeah. And uh, basically, these, these lines here, uh, when they get thicker, it's basically there are more important pets than the others. The, the attention mechanism gives more importance to these pets to make the prediction. 
So uh, besides this, uh, about the, in this case, the prediction was naming the function, but uh, the big uh, contribution of this publication was to make the represent the vector representation of code. And then he says you can use it to a lot of different tasks. And but in the the paper and the talk that he gave, we used it to label a snippet of code, basically summarizing the code. Yeah, so now if you know a bunch of yeah it gives a lot of examples and uh, then it's able to predict it's not that uh, that magic because if i you can see here if i try to mess it up a little it will it will break completely like if i put the 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 end here Put the end here, it will break completely, basically. Yeah, it's it, it, it gives rubbish, basically. Yeah, it's uh, it's cool for some examples, but if you try to mess it up a little bit, it breaks completely, basically. It lost all sense there. But this uh, this algorithm is actually also really good. Not only to summarize the code in a vector in a vector form, but also it captures really rich embeddings between the tokens. Like Ventura mentioned, the word to vec, you can see the distance between the, the vectors to find analogies, similar words and stuff like that. And in this approach, you also get th those kinds of embeddings. You can see here also, like if you plug in count, the most uh, the closest uh, embedding is um, we shall see. Is get count, for example, if you put like x to be y. And you also can do combinations like equals and to lower. It gets equals ignore case. And like analogies, receive is to download, the send is to upload, or if you put like uh, x. Why with I, you see this it, it gets really good uh, good embeddings that uh, it, it really captures the semantic relationships between the tokens of the program. Mm -hmm. So in another talk, in another talk in this area also uh, brought up the different problems that that are in this big code area. Big code is basically learning how to predict code. Uh, he talked he talked about his automatic design, basically from a screenshot of a website or from a mockup, generating the code behind it. It uh, is a really recent uh, research area. The first paper on this uh, area was released just last year but uh, it's really being trendy now. Uh, basically, uh, the, the point is you don't have to do these redundant steps between taking the mockup and then giving it to a designer and then giving it to a front-end developer to, to write the HTML CSS between, uh, behind the site. You just pass the mockup right to, to the model and the model will be able to generate automatically the HTML and CSS behind it. He gave an example here uh, like from this uh, screenshot of a site, the is is tool like generated this code, and this is actually one of uh, our master thesis. Like next semester, we'll be writing this topic. Then he talked also about probabilistic models of code. This I won't get too deep into because all the talks talk about this also, so I want to talk about it here. Uh, translation of programming languages that Vintura already mentioned. It's a much harder problem than in natural language processing because you have zero tolerance for mistake and uh, you, you can't have noise like in natural language. He also talked about statistical deobfuscation. Uh, he showed this uh, JS nice example that basically you give a program with all the variables hidden and the, and the types and uh, the machine learning model can infer what are those types and what are those names. It's uh, it's also a much harder problem than the just, just naming a variable because here you have no 
no types and no variable names, it's a much harder problem also. He also talked about learning from previous commits to, to find bugs. And, but basically, most of this talk was about learning to analyze programs. It was a little bit complex. Basically, he gave a data set of programs, transformed into uh, the AST, then he transformed it to, to, to uh, its own domain specific language. He applied some mag magic features, magic semantic features to it, and uh, by, uh, uh, by seeing uh, the correctness of the model, creating some tags like the statements or variable names, he, could, he would learn to analyze the program. Uh, this is a very, very high level of uh, description of what he made because it was a bit complex. Uh, so mm -hmm. When you say magic features, uh, are they to, open and described in the paper? Or uh, it, it didn't describe them much in the talk. Uh, I don't know if in the paper uh, they are open or, de or described. But in the talk, yeah, it was basically... And crafted features. Uh, not learned. No, no, it was, uh, it was not learned. It was features that, that it was inputted, yeah. So the next the next talk I will present is the bugs. That is basically a machine learning model to find bugs. He he began to give, uh, to present a little empirical study that he made uh, with uh, some well known st static analyzers of of bugs, uh, spot bugs, uh, error prone and infer. And from uh, the 594 bugs he gave these these models, all of them combined only found. Uh, 27 of them, because uh, they they couldn't find the er the context specific errors. Uh, they just found like general errors. None of them found the same uh, bug. So the intersection of yeah, the bugs zero. that each of them found was yeah. zero. Yeah. Zero. Not yeah, and they give a lot of false false positives. Yeah. So you explain a little bit by why are most bugs missed because you need to go beyond the generic uh, context and go like to the specific context of the pro of the problem. And he presented this model that he basically gave to the model some buggy code and some correct code, and uh, he classified it as uh, buggy or okay. It was basically a simple classifying model, and with that you would learn. How to when you got new code? How to present? How to classify it? Yes. Yeah, that's where the bug was like from detection. Yes. So, um, he, he generated bugs. Yeah, so yeah I would talk like uh, yes. switching arguments. It, it so, did. So, he did uh, like five articles. Test, uh, when training. When training. So he would yeah. run the, the test data set as a variable. Code, and also he, he would uh, create uh, an example. He would pick an example that was okay, and then uh, automatically, like, put the bug there and yes. train with both examples: the, the original okay and the now synthesized buggy code, so that the model could train uh, on things like, oh, these pr parameters are probably uh, switched, or they're probably the wrong number here, or things like that. You basically switch arguments, switch binary operands, and uh, another one also that I'm not recording, but you basically uh, introduce a lot of artificial errors to the program just to train it. Uh, yeah, th this approach actually sees the program as a token, a stream token. It doesn't use the AST, but uh, he also has that uh, semantical relationship because, like, for each argument of the function, he has the name of it, the type, and the Formal parameter name embedded, and uh, you can see here that uh, it concatenates all these embeddings in the stream of tokens. And here you can see an example of a bug that he detects, and that a normal static analyzer wouldn't detect. That he like switches the two and the y uh, here, and uh, he detects it because he sees that he all, uh, it's a switching it's switching positions. Here you can see. He basically did these three, these three types of errors introduced, uh, swapping arguments, uh, changing binary operands, and uh, changing binary operators. And he has a really high accuracy. Uh, and you can also see that learning those semantic relationships in the embeddings are actually improving his score a little bit, well, when improving 
uh, as opposed to just random uh, embeddings that are not trained and that don't capture the semantic relationships between the tokens. Can you just give a little bit more context on the re results? Because my interpretation is that is that a random model versus a no no the the random embeddings ah, random embedding. no embedding is not learned basically like uh, representing the token by a random embedding and yeah, represent. Like, uh, what, what is he comparing against? He's not comparing, basically, he's just okay. seeing, uh, because he, he gave uh, like artificial uh, examples, because he generated this code to, to test it also. Yeah. Right. Uh, what was the proportion of bugs versus correct Ver examples? Versus correct example. Yeah, uh, I could check the slides, but okay. I'm going Sorry. Sorry. But it was much better than the other one, definitely. Right. Did he actually test? So he had he had those static analyzers, mm -hmm. and he said that they only detected twenty seven of uh, five hundred. Five hundred. Yeah. Did he test this on those five hundred? Is this accuracy against those five hundred or not? I think not because he introduced the because okay. he only he only uh, checked against these three types of errors that he introduced basically. I I don't think he checked against the other ones. Yeah. Exactly. So after we basically uh, continuing on the bug detection and warning detection uh, team, uh, the next talk was about uh, uh, ranking the warnings that appear before you. This is also uh, really close to us because like in the trust advisor, we get a lot of false positives, for example. And this model, what he did was to rank these warnings according to feedback gave by the user. Basically, in the beginning, each warning had a probability of being a positive or of being a true positive or not. And when the user uh, uh, declared that warning as a true positive or not, the, the, the that probability decreased or increased based on that feedback. And not not only from that warning, but from all warnings that were from the same family that that he detected basically. And basically, after a few iterations, he he got all the through positive up, basically prioritize them up and all the uh, false positives down, basically. After I think just five iterations, he got all of them up. It was really cool. Yeah. So it, 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 warnings were not, the warnings were static analysis warnings? Yeah, so you didn't yeah. touch them. So no, no, it just ranks the warnings. Analyzer after. that has a lot of false positives and yeah. just, just learns how to rank those. Yeah, prioritize the warnings. And you can you could see the probabilities like changing after each iteration. How much data did he have? Uh, I what don't was think. It iterative? So, so basically, you had the warnings. Someone. Yeah, you had to a few, or did you label like all the all the warnings? So show the the next one. Yeah. So he got inside this. Whenever he labeled a warning, it would re-rank all the exactly. all the ones when you from, gave feedback uh, the, the same family, and that's why. Uh, uh, after just a few iterations, all, all of the true positives yeah. on, were on the top. And this all is the, pretty interesting. And mm -hmm. It was pretty cool because he, he actually made a, a live demo <coughs> where he started with like 500 warnings and he labeled like three or four of them. I, yeah. and, and suddenly uh, the, the warnings uh, were, they, they had actually a really good threshold to the, the true positives and the false positives, they, they have a, a huge difference in the confidence that the system assigned to, to the warning. So would this be applicable to also true change, for example? Okay. Yeah, definitely. How about, uh, I want to see these warnings that the person asked me, but do you feel that might be used for emphasis there? Uh, yeah, so this, this uh, ranking could be done by, by each profile, so he, did this. It, it was actually a relatively fast process, so I think it, it could be done per user because, yeah, some, some people are more interested in some things that. When you say they are of the same class, are you talking about? So, and use variables maybe are less of a problem than. Real it, it wasn't just the class of the problem because otherwise it's an prioritization yeah, problem. But, but you would you would look into a lot of conditions that uh, contributed for the signaling of that warning, 
if he would uh, start uh, having or losing confidence in those in pre preconditions, preconditions, yes. So another interesting talk, um, like me to mention in programming language, we have a lot of neologisms like combinations of words and it really increases the vocabulary size because you have, like you said, like uh, another example, like company and name and, like, and then you have company name all together, like variable names and function names. Uh, you have a, a huge vocabulary size because of combinations. And uh, this approach basically tried to use machine learning to get all the sub tokens, the sub words that, that uh, were combined to give the word. This uh, is, is very good for, for machine learning because you really um, uh, decrease the sparsity of the data. Uh, like I will show, um, he first did an approach with some heuristics, some normal heuristics, like divi dividing by upper case, by camel case, the, the usual stuff to divide words into sub words. Uh, this divided some somewhat the, the data, but he then applied some uh, convolution neural network that this scheme doesn't matter much, but basically he went to each character of the word and he, he just uh, ran over it like uh, from the beginning to end and from end to beginning and uh, with some examples from Wikipedia corpus and using an internal uh, tool that uh, get uh, that uh, showed the examples, the correct examples from that corpus divided the words. You have here the results, basically started with 49.2 million unique identifiers. With the heuristics, you was able to to split, to, uh, you, you could split basically 36.1 with heuristics. And with, the, with those heuristics, you, 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 uh, you were uh, left with a vocabulary size with, of 1.6 million. And with the his machine learning model, you went like to only 0 0.7. Basically, uh, after the, 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 the uh, that model, you you passed from a 2.9 million vocabulary size to 1.1, basically almost a third. And it, this was a really great reduction that really facilitates learning because the sparsity of data and the new words basically are much, much uh, less significant. No, those 49.2 was what? Uh, was the unique identifiers like what? in the uh, in this in this corpus of data set he didn't mention was it source code uh, was source code it yeah. was some snapshot from Peter oh, yeah. he he just uh, languages or languages? Uh, a specific language yeah okay. it's code it's all code yeah no not natural language yeah. so when you talk about the uh, you're talking about uh, it's basically imagine when we have like imagine we have a company name and a company underscore name this gives like two two different uh, words in the vocabulary but they are basically the same the same thing and uh, with with the heuristics basically they are given different different uh, uh, predictions you you will predict something like company name altogether and another one, a different thing. And with this reduction, you can see that they are the same thing. So the model is able to generalize much better and the sparsity re reduces a lot because you can fit all the similar word, all the same words together in the same, in the same vocabulary position, basically. Yeah. So another, another talk, uh, this was actually a more, private talk because we don't have the slides for this one because it's not published yet. But it was about uh, trying to predict the next edit of the code. Uh, basically, the guy that did this uh, presentation uh, with the sequence of previous edits to the code, he tried to predict what would be the next edit of code. Basically, from that sequence of edits, he tried to predict the intent. Uh, I will show a very brief example. like. Uh, you, you first have this, this function, you make this edit, and basically the, what, uh, what the model does is predict what will be the next probable edit. Here, basically, the, the next probable edit, you can see that is uh, replacing the 1,000 there in sleep by the delay uh, variable. He learns to 
do this quick edit. Not edits like changing uh, 10 lines of code, but this uh, quick fix edits, basically. And now I'm going to pass the word again to Hindu. OK, so um, I'm going to, to have to introduce another uh, concept that, that was uh, quite a, a cornerstone for a lot of the work that was presented at, at the conference. Uh, it was something that was that started like uh, more than a decade ago, but just a few years uh, back, it, it has been like uh, evolving really, really fast. And so the the idea is that um, RNNs they they take sequences. They are well, kind of well studied, not as much well understood, but. Um, Code is not just a sequence. I mean, you, especially if you look at our code, our code is, is a graph. It has ifs with that branch. So I, I cannot just put that into a sequence. Uh, it's, it's, really, it's really hard. So the, the general idea of a graph neural network is that it's, it's a way to treat a whole graph as an input of a, of a neural network. And the way, um, the way this is done is, um, Let's imagine that we have here a graph. So it could be like an out systems application with a start and action. There's an if here. Uh, it does something else. And here it does uh, something else. Um, actually, the, the if has um, two kinds of, of connectors. It, it has, a, let's use colors, uh, a false connector and a true connector. OK. And so, um, what what's the the general idea here? It's we we want to kind of capture uh, the information of everything that's uh, that's going on. So we want to be able to say that um, this node is somehow influenced by what's happening here and perhaps by what's happening over here, because that's really the way that uh, code works. And so the general idea of uh, graph uh, neural networks is that um, we we give uh, each uh, each node a message. Let's put here an M. Each node has its own message, and they're all different messages, like embeddings for the nodes that that are all all across the graph. And now uh, we we do some steps into this network where um, each node will collect all the messages from uh, all the nodes it connects to. So um, this uh, if node here will connect, uh, will collect this message. So it's going to have like a, a green M here. And it's also going to take this uh, M from here. And it will also uh, collect the one that comes from here because uh, although the the connection is made from here to here i'll say that hey i got this guy and it's like the it came from the the opposite side of of an arrow and so at the end of one cycle i i got like all all the information from here from here from here and so this uh the information that this node contains now is influenced by all this area. And the information that this node contains is influenced by this area. And the one that this node contains is by this area. And so we see that after not that many iterations, like every node will know a lot about the graph because this information will propagate uh, quite, quite a lot and, and quite fast. So this is the, the general idea of uh, graph neural networks. Uh, we have this, uh, we'll have some, some matrix that represents these connections and we'll do uh, a few steps of propagating information and collecting information. And we uh, use stuff like attention networks and embeddings to uh, respectively uh, understand how much uh, of each uh, node should I collect information from and uh, what is represented in uh, each node. And so that's the, the general idea. 
And um, oh, something else that, that I forgot to talk about is that yeah, lost my pen. No, okay, here it is. Um, there, when we're talking about codes, uh, we have like this uh, variable x uh, equals f, and now there's a lot of code, and now I have like y equals x plus one. And um, there's there's a lot of uh, relations going on here. So this uh, this x, yeah, it was defined uh, here. That's right. So that means uh, it 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 contributes to to the value of y in here, and um, the the f will contribute to the the value of x here. So the, the kind of edges that I'll have between uh, nodes are not just how does the code uh, is executed, but also some other kinds of relations, like where was this variable last assigned? Uh, where was it first defined? Uh, who else wrote on it? And so I, I can fill this graph that represents a program with a lot of edges that we usually don't think about, but that help us collecting additional information about what's what's going on here. And so, um, after we have this uh, basic model of graph neural networks, we can do uh, lots of interesting things. For instance, uh, pick a graph that that uh, has uh, embeddings for for the types of the nodes. And try to train the the, the model to um, guess uh, types for for things. Um, and one of the talks that we had was about this phenomena called uh, primitive obsession that all developers have. And so, what the primitive obsession is uh, is uh, I want to say my variable is a distance. I'll say it's an integer. Uh, it's not an instance. Uh, a distance. It's a weight integer, uh, it's a factor, integer, it's a delay, integer, integers for everything, name, string, uh, password, string, everything, string. So um, developers are kind of lazy at defining types for, for stuff. And uh, this can lead to some um, strange uh, situations, like uh, it, it makes sense to concatenate the first name and the last name, both strings and show them on the UI, it makes a little less sense to concatenate the first name with the password and show on the UI. Uh, but if they're all strings, then the type checker will not help me with this. However, if I had the system that could guess specific types for everything, so for instance, my password would no longer be the type string, it would be the, pi the type password that's close to string, but it's not assignable from any other string, or I cannot just add it to any other string. Um, that, that would help me prevent uh, a lot of bugs. The same thing for um, the, the distance, the factors. And the idea here is that if I have a, a function that takes a lot of integers, and some are the delay, some are the number of items, et cetera, if they all had different types, I couldn't just inadvertently uh, switch the parameters and not uh, detect the bug because the, the type checker would instantly start uh, throwing errors. Um, so this uh, kind of uh, type detection is useful even for strongly typed uh, languages. And the example that was given was um, C Sharp. Of course, it can be even more useful in uh, languages like uh, JavaScript uh, where we we had also some examples, because uh, uh, Prodo, uh, which were sponsors of this uh, conference, that their business is around type checking things on on, uh, on JavaScript um, to help developers catching, catching bugs. And their approach um, is actually kind of smart. It, uh, it can uh, infer a little bit better than TypeScript and Flow on a, on a series of uh, situations. Um, so we have, is, was yeah. this work from Prudo? Uh, the C -sharp the, as well? No, the C sharp was from the, the same guy that introduced the bimodality concept. Okay. So he, he not, not only he uh, used different types for the, the primitives, but he also inferred, for instance, 
oh, this uh, user password and host are always traveling together to the same functions, then perhaps this should be a structure or some, some class or whatever. Yeah, so, so I know that you can all think of someone, we cannot say names because this is being recorded, but you can all think of someone that would benefit a lot if the system could tell that person, hey, you don't use these 50 variables, put this into, into a structure. Um, or don't name them from A00 to A50, just give them the, the proper names. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, um, okay. Um, the, the graph neural networks, they, they were like, uh, not just in these uh, two talks, they, they were talked about in, in lots of talks because the, the guys that have been studying these are like, their, their work is used as basis for everything else that's being made uh, in this area. And so now we'll dig into another topic, which is program synthesis, so building programs. Uh, and building programs is hard because we need context, specs, logic. Uh, we, as humans, use tooling that help us uh, guiding some, some mistakes because we don't know the language spec by heart. We kind of have an idea of it, and then we code, we, we see some red squiggly lines or compiler errors, then we adjust the stuff. We also have experience from past bugs that, that we made so that we try not to make them again. We go search for documentation, for samples. So as humans, we, can, we, we do a lot of stuff, and even we don't get it right uh, most times. Um, so uh, it, it's expected that this is a hard problem for uh, automatic systems too. Um, the general idea here is finding a black box that takes a specification and a, a, a programming language grammar and spits out uh, a program. So this is the, the general idea. Um, this is really difficult because uh, most tasks don't actually have a spec um we cannot just try every combination of every program and expect to to reach some uh, sensible result um and so there are uh, two techniques that can help us one is to use uh, some kind of statistics to interpret uh, the the meaning of programs like uh, jean already showed that try to infer the name the intention of a, a program and uh, uh, another useful thing is kind of trying to search for code that, that uh, does something. So if I can understand meaning from a program, then perhaps I can find the program from the meaning, and perhaps that might help me trying to autocomplete some things. And so um, we can see this uh, Bayou uh, demo, uh, where well, what we have here is some code, and then there's this special comment, and I click here on the generate code, and what will happen is, um, given the context and what I wrote here in the comment, it will try to produce some codes that kind of fits the, the task that, that was given. Uh, and the way it does this is it, it tries to, to see uh, known examples that, that it has. It, it understands the meaning. It, it goes fetch something that um, it thinks this should do uh, something similar to what's being asked, and then it tries to adjust the 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 tree, the syntax tree that's produced, such that uh, in the end everything type checks, so that the the code is synthetically correct, and hopefully semantically it will also do what has been requested. So, for instance, if here instead of a buffered reader, I try a String builder, uh, just to make things funny. Uh, let's see what this is going to give us. And OK, I still have the buffered reader, but now I have a, a string uh, builder here that's being uh, fed. And, and then in the end, I, I get the, the string. So. The code is correct. Uh, it's it's not like the prettiest code. It's probably not how you do this, but it's actually doing what it was intended, and it's using the spec 
that was provided. So it's actually something uh, really cool. It's even more than one together. You can like go with the oh, yeah. and see the other example there. Yeah, right. So it, it figured out uh, like some uh, some other change. You like 10, 10 programs that are statically correct. So the spec doesn't involve any kind of output, right? So it has no way to check if you're given a certain input, the output is correct. Not, not for this problem. So this is more like program search where I try to find pieces of code that I think they should do something like this, and, and I try to fit them into, into this piece so that, this that corpus, was here. This corpus is the keywords from the... The, uh, the, doc, what's the corpus used for? Uh, ah. So public code, uh, it tries to infer from uh, the javadoc strings uh, what should be the, the intent of the function that's being like placed. Problem, it, it, it doesn't even like take into consideration the input or like the user chose the eighth one and not the first one, we should re-rank the suggestion. Does not do that. Yeah. So um, some, something else that's being uh, tried here uh, is uh, transfer learning. So the idea here is that if you train a, a model for some task, then you should at least be able to use parts of that model for some other uh, task. And this, this, uh, this is a technique that's uh, being used quite successfully in some areas of uh, machine learning, for instance, uh, Google has a lot of servers, and so they train a huge uh, neural network uh, with huge computing power to um, uh, with a data set that's ImageNet that has like thousands of categories of images. And you pick that model that was trained by them. You just do a little tweaking on, on the, the edge of the model, and now you train it much faster to detect cancer cells in a... Uh, uh, x-rays uh, or something and you get really high accuracies really fast without needing the hardware that only google or some other tech giant has so transfer learning has been applied to a lot of places the embeddings are also uh, an example so the someone trains word to vec and suddenly everyone can use word to vec for their own tasks and um, there, there's some work uh, that's uh, is being done to try to apply also transfer learning to, to program synthesis. And there's the, this idea here that if a model can learn to write code, it could also try to learn uh, neural network architectures that could write more code. I don't know. So we, we could go meta here, turtles all the way down. Um, OK, uh, now uh, I'm going to, to skim through these topics, because they, these were uh, all from a single talk. Uh, and uh, it was a really dense talk. And uh, all we could get were references to some other cool stuff that we didn't know about. Um, and um, so um, starting with neural synthesis. So this is a screenshot from Excel. They have this feature called flash fill that, um, given some inputs, uh, creates some outputs and understands how this transformation should be done and does the transformation. And this is really awesome because it it can uh, get uh, it, it can get to transformations that have uh, some degree of complexity. Uh, here we can see that it didn't guess anything for uh, those that didn't have a middle name, so kind of weird. He didn't have, he only had two examples, but he, he did an awesome, an, an awesome work with just uh, two examples. Um, of course, uh, these, uh, the, here we don't have a, a formal specification, we only have examples. So perhaps we could also uh, find some adversarial examples. And so here's an example where uh, flash fill is trained uh, with the first four phone numbers and then fed with some others. And we can see that it produces incorrect results because it had never seen phone numbers that had uh, more or less than uh, two uh, international identifier digits. So here the 386 
uh, it, it doesn't go well. The, the six just uh, disappears because instead of understanding, hey, I should stop at the, at the dash or at the space, uh, it learned, hey, I just need the first two digits. So um, can we blame the model? It had no specification. We as humans have a lot more context about what a phone number is. Uh, so for us, uh, the the error uh, is uh, is quite clear, but uh, well, uh, for the model, it is what it is. Um, still, um, it, it's it's awesome how how much this uh, this kind of uh, flash fill approach can can get for for synthesis. Another area, testing. Uh, so I don't know if you know what. Fuzzing is, but essentially it's uh, abusing of some program's inputs to try to find uh, problems like crashes, uh, some security bugs usually. Um, so the idea is you, you have this uh, PNG image and you go and uh, switch random bytes on it. And now you try to get your browser to show you the image and uh, you'll see if the browser crashes or not. If, if it crashes, then probably you have uh, an opportunity for an exploit uh, there. Um, so um, some guys at Microsoft have been applying um, the neural networks to, to the, the problem of fuzzing to understand better which bytes should be tweaked to crash the programs uh, um, more and in in this case, uh, crashing more is good because we're actually trying to find the the crashes. And um, not only were they successfully in uh, getting more crashes, but more crashes in less time and with better coverage because the the program could learn to 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 see what should be changed. Uh, and the the idea is that not all bytes from the the image were born equally. Um, yeah, so. Let me ask you something. Uh, so, this neural fuzzing, do you see any direct application of this method to just application testing or function unit testing? Or yeah, so there's uh, something that's not fuzzing, but it's kind of similar, which is the, the approaches like uh, Haskell's quick check or uh, FS check uh, that, that see, oh, this is a function that takes an integer, so I'll try with some interesting integers. It's zero, one, minus one, uh, 1,000, uh, minus 1,000. It tries with a lot of inputs and sees if it always gives the, the right outputs. And perhaps this could be used to guide into understanding which, uh, which inputs should be tried uh, first or better instead of just trying all the integers or all the strings. Um, Okay, uh, so program synthesis and its connections to general artificial intelligence. This is from the mind. Mind. Yeah. yeah, this <laughs> is from a guy from DeepMind. <laughs> yeah, because they love reinforcement learning. So uh, this talk I'm going to present is from a colleague of the guy that did this dance talk that we talked about. So this talk was also really dense. Uh, it was from DeepMind, so we did all with reinforcement learning because they love reinforcement learning there. So, uh, so I will give first a brief introduction to what reinforcement learning is. Like in in a sentence, reinforcement learning uh, gives rewards to certain actions and tries to find a model, a, a policy that maximizes those rewards. Here with a very simple uh, mice in uh, mouse in, in elaborate example, basically we have the mouse and we have the cheese and uh, here uh, you have water there and lightnings and uh, the mouse is rewarded when he gets the, the cheese and he gets a negative reward when he hits some lightning or water. Basically, uh, the mouse with this will learn to not go to, to the water or the lightning and follow the path to the cheese. It's basically a really simple example of how the environment gives uh, rewards to the, to the agent, that is the mouse in this case, and the agent will learn how to follow the correct actions to arrive to the maximum reward. So Google loves this because they did the AlphaGo that like uh, beat the be the world's best uh, Go player 
and they did it with reinforcement learning, learning uh, with some states of the of the game that were good states to arrive, and they train it against uh, they train with with humans, and then they train with uh, two machines one against another to like learn new plays that weren't learned only with human players, and they arrived to a system that basically completely destroyed the the human player basically. And they love reinforcement learning because of this, basically. And this talk here uh, uh, introduced reinforcement learning in the artificial general intelligence field. What is this concept of artificial general intelligence? Contrary to some more normal artificial intelligence that are that is applied to more specific tasks, this artificial general intelligence is a, is a way to uh, arrive to a more general model that is able to generalize to different tests and be more hum be with a more human intelligence be able to reason uh, to adapt to new to new environments to be more general basically and reinforcement learning fits really well here because unlike supervised learning with neural networks or recurrent neural networks that Vintro already mentions you you don't need like really clean training examples like you don't need like a training data that has really clean labels that in the real world is really hard to find. You hear you learn from mistakes, basically. You try some combinations, it's a little bit of the exploration versus exploit or exploitation trade-off. Basically, you try some combinations, uh, and when you arrive to a state, a good or bad state, you are given feedback. Uh, it's like learning from mistakes, like a human learning process. You, you try some stuff, if you fail, you get that feedback. You won't try that, that same stuff again. And if you succeed, you know that that is a good a combination of ac actions and you will try it again. So uh, he then talked about these uh, applications more to programming. Like, like Ventura said, you normally don't have full specs to a program. You have really incomplete one, really bad ones. And he did some programs to try to infer the full spec of a program to then learn learn the model with, with those full specs. This was this was basically after this was really dense and it talked about some models. I'm just gonna refer refer a, a few of, of the tests he, he referred. Uh, one he, he mentioned was policy di distillation. Basically what this is is he trained a neural network to uh, with a car arrive to the finish line and he couldn't uh, get off track. You, you see here the lines, he had to follow the path, and he, he was able to train that with reinforcement learning, he arrived to a, to a good result. But the car was like moving not smoothly. It was like making harsh curves and stuff like that. It was not steady. And so what he did was he converted this uh, policy of the reinforcement learning, the sequence of actions that he, he had to take, he translated it into a program. And after he translated into a program, he, the the movement of the car became way more smooth and the car like didn't do, did all those abrupt changes and it was really really more smooth this was one cool example that he showed another one was even more out of the box basically because in this uh, reinforcement learning approach you need to have a reward function you need to give rewards to the to the agent so that he knows that oh here, here is a good state i i should go here or this is a bad state, I shouldn't go here. But uh, in the real world, sometimes the goal state is not that clear. Like uh, if you say, fold my towel in a fancy way, you don't know what, what is a fancy way, what is not a fancy way. How, how do I give a reward to this? So you, you can uh, try to learn what is a good state. And how do you do this? He showed like from a set of instructions, you know that like to fold a towel in a fancy way, you need to follow these instructions. So instead of feeding the policy with the goal states that that were hard to, to know what they were in some cases like this, he fed some instructions. And afterwards, he was able to learn that those instructions gave to a good state. He basically learned what, what were the good states from the set of instructions that he had to, that he had to follow. It was basically some next level stuff. He had the discriminatory, the discriminatory model to that, that receives the instructions and what were uh, good uh, good things to do, and he fed that into the policy of the model to to give the rewards. He basically learned the reward model from another another model. It was some next level stuff, basically. 
so and another, another interesting thing we heard in the conference also was how do do we put these models in production because this is really nice talking about the general ideas and the theory behind it but what is it like in real life so we had like uh, microsoft research guys there that actually put this stuff into real life into their intellicode stuff in visual studio and what is this you, you you look at this image and you think oh this is this is live this when when i type something it, it gives me this warning no because this is just a like code review platform that they will install in uh, i guess in visual studio because uh, only the the program in python basically the models of machine learning and only the integration of their machine learning model to the to the visual studio suppresses their their time they have like 10 milliseconds time that they can block the program because of typing they, they, can, they can't block it for more than 10 milliseconds and only this integration of the their models in python to the actual code suppresses this uh, 10 milliseconds so they can't do it live basically they have to do it like in a static code review platform and this is like a challenge uh, because they can't uh, introduce it really uh, how they want. For us, it's not that uh, that formatted because it's more drag and drop, not not so much typing. So we have a bigger uh, time uh, interval. But, but you also have this problem yeah, but... because we, we cannot like while the user is drag and dropping, mm. like the user drops and now you go, hey, mm. just let me try to figure out what you really want to do yeah. here. And so the they have this real pressure on speed and on the fact that yes. if the model has knowledge about all the repos in GitHub, perhaps it's a big model, so it cannot be shipped just with uh, every uh, developer's machine and run as you type. So they they only they are for now only applying this to the code review process, and it's made synchronously. Yeah. So while so yeah, then it's submitted for code review. The 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 verifier will go there and check mm -hmm. it. And, it will have more time to do that. Yeah, he, when we talked to like the guy that coordinated this, he, 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 he just said, "Oh, they, they are pressing us to downsize the time that we are that we are blocking the stuff, so we cannot put anything there, basically. So they they push it back to code review. But you can see here in the IntelliCode in the code review that uses the those graph neural networks that Ventura mentioned is able to capture like that. You have x two minus x one, so you probably want uh, y2 minus y1, but he, he put like x1 and he was able to, oh, you did you mean y1 instead of x1? So he's able to capture these more difficult bugs. He's really able to capture it. Uh, could we test it internally with our code base? Uh, this is for C-sharp. But yeah, it's, but it, it's not really, yeah, it, yeah, it's not even, not... Uh, and it only works on new changes, right? You can tell it to look at the full project this, this is internal. This one, I don't know. The, the, the other thing from Facebook only used so looking at new changes. It's, I don't know. Too difficult to test. See what. But uh, are, it, they are testing this internally currently only. I think, uh, and they are having some because test testing this. And another thing they told us about it, it was that testing this internally had some problems that their users were too too expert. And like uh, they, for example, had uh, assigned a null to an object and then used the object uh, method and it gave a warning because it could be null, but they didn't care because they, they said it would, it would never be null there and they, were, they had some issues there because they were basically too expert in some cases. And uh, yeah, they, they had some problems there also. So another major challenge that those guys from Microsoft Research that gave talks here talked about was these four topics. Basically, the uh, user experience uh, topic is pretty much obvious because uh, how do we introduce this in the product? How do we introduce this in a way that that is uh, uh, fl that is fluid and it, it's u it's uh, easy for the user to to use and it's not too intelligent too intelligent that the user won't be able to know how to use it and it. It's, use, it's useless in, in that case. So that was one of the problems you mentioned. Another problem was the machine learning capabilities because, because if, even even they in Microsoft uh, that, they, that are more advanced don't have the machine learning capabilities to do all the things they want currently. 
but this is a fast uh, it is a fast advancing topic so this is not the biggest problem right now the metrics is also a really big problem because how do you know that the code architecture is the right architecture or a code is well written or not is also not that objective to measure and what what metrics do you use to measure it like when you're creating a variable name do you use just accuracy if it's the right exact match or do you use like if it's a similar uh, name like uh, cat and cats or something like that you need to take that in consideration not just accuracy it's sometimes hard to measure the performance of a machine learning model also and the resources uh, sometimes you don't have all the that resources available some some do but uh, sometimes th this is an issue also uh, to test the model and to for, for the feedback loop not to be that big so uh, we basically joined all these talks into these uh, three topics but uh, there were another two talks that didn't match any of these topics that were more uh, like uh, out of, out of place in any of these topics. One was a closed style q a in Stack Overflow. Basically, uh, what he did was just to try to figure out a closed style question based on Stack Overflow data. Like in this case, basically, what he used was the tag of the of the question, the the, the text of the question, and he, he went to search also for uh, other questions that use that same tag and try to see if the answer was in any of the, the, the other questions, basic of Stack Overflow. Uh, you can also see here some of the, the answers. You, uh, basically, the KCC is the complete model. You can see that it got for the first suggestion was right in these three examples. And like the, the by Gru model was just using the question and the CC model was just using the tag when you use both models you get the better better result so now i'm going to pass again to yeah. the so last call the, just before uh before that here the 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 problem with uh, answering programming questions is that usually uh and, and like historical facts or something uh the answer is nowhere written uh, to be found so many times when someone asks something on stack overflow you cannot just go to wikipedia and get the answer because the question will be really specific to a really specific context so there's there's no way you can just harvest a, a corpus of uh, uh questions and answers and be able to 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 answer that so we had just uh, one final talk about measuring uh, develop, developer productivity. So the idea here is you have a sequence of observable events, which are commits, and you want to understand the hidden events behind those commits, which are the developer starts to code, the developer is coding, the developer has stopped coding. And by inferring those hidden states, uh, you can then measure how much time um, each change, each commit uh, took to a developer and what commits take more time and what projects are more complex in some manner. And so an interesting insight that was brought here was that uh, developers tend to take more time when they are making things negative than they take when they make things positive. So, Swapping uh, a variable, uh, uh, swapping um, true by false or false by true uh, is actually uh, very different in terms of the time it takes for someone to, to think about this change and make it. And the same goes for uh, different uh, or, or equals. So switching from, from equals to different uh, takes uh, a lot more time uh, than switching from different to equals. So apparently some uh, things that seem to be really uh, similar have uh, different cognitive loads on, on uh, developers and they take really different time to, to make these, uh, these changes. Um, so that's uh, essentially it. I don't know if we have like a final slide. No, we don't. So. Uh, <laughs> The, this was it. I don't know if there's any more questions. Um, in any case, uh, 
you know where we sit, so you can ask us there. Yeah, Are John. Are going to try to clean the 200 uh, warnings on the no, we are not. Uh, we'll prioritize. <laughs> we'll prioritize. <laughs> about reading rooms. Oh, yeah. So uh, if you're interested on uh, these topics and about uh, what's uh, coming out, the bleeding edge of, uh, of uh, AI applied to programming, we have a reading group every Friday morning. Uh, every other Friday morning, yeah. Um, where we uh, discuss some paper that either just came out or might be a little bit older, but still really very relevant for, for this area. So this is it. Thank you all for coming or for listening remotely. Uh, and um, well, take care.